Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Martin. I'm streaming here today for Tonebase. At Tonebase, we aim to democratize access to the highest quality music education. I welcome everybody. And today, really everybody, because we are streaming to you to, uh, to Tonebase guitar, Tonebase violin and Tonebase piano. And we are streaming to YouTube as well. We have a very, very special topic today for the time of the year when people are starting to play for each other, play for friends, play little concerts, wherever you want to do that. And uh, sometimes you, you recognize, well, I'm playing, but somehow I'm very, very nervous when I do that. So today we are talking about taking control of your performance and becoming comfortable on stage. And for that, I invited my very dear friend, Steve Goss. Hi, Steve. How are you doing today? Hi, Martin. I'm doing very well. Thank you. How are you? I'm I'm very fine because I'm talking to you again and I always enjoy this so much. We do these live streams um, every week and Steve Goss is a regular guest. He comes in approximately every month and I enjoy every single time I talk to you because of your wisdom, because of your experience, because of your insights and just because of the good time that we have for the next 60 minutes. Everybody, if you have questions, please feel free to ask questions in the chat or using the Q&A function on Tonebase and we make sure to address those at the end of the presentation and uh, we're gonna have a good time today. So Steve, um, let's start with a fun one. So one, when, like, how do you enjoy being alone on stage? And when was the last time that you have that, that you have been doing that? All <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> this is a, an interesting question because um, I stopped giving uh, professional concerts in 2015 to concentrate on composing. But up until that point, I played in a quartet for 27 years, toured all over the place, did a lot of concerts with them, did lots of voice and guitar stuff, played in contemporary music ensembles. But as you can tell, none of this sounds like playing solo. And playing solo is a very different ordeal to playing in an ensemble. Uh, when you play in an ensemble, you've got so much else to think about. You've got the players around you. You've got that camaraderie on stage. But when you're playing solo, it's it's pretty brutal. And I do do it from time to time. And uh, it's always very different from playing in a group because it doesn't matter how many times you've done it. There's always, always that performance anxiety there. There's always something about it. Yeah, and today we are going to learn all about that, <clears throat> how to fight that feeling and how to take control and make that uh, place your very, very own. And we've prepared a wonderful, wonderful presentation for you. We are going to share that in the forums of Tonebase. So if you are not a sign up uh, Tonebase member yet, please feel free to start a trial and then you have access to all the side materials that we are releasing um, together with those live streams and with, uh, uh, with the gazillion productions that we do all the time. <laughs> so Fantastic. let's start today. What are we talking about today? Exactly what's 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 the deal with performance and playing? And yeah, stuff? what happens? What happens to our playing when we're sitting at home and everything is fine and comfortable and we're feeling great? Then we suddenly go out on stage and everything changes. The heart beats faster, the adrenaline's pumping around our, our veins. And so what can we do to kind of deal with that situation? So that's what we're addressing today. Lots of uh, ideas, techniques and information. Uh, also a few recommendations of books and other places you can get more information. Of course, this is an absolutely enormous topic. And tonight in the next 60 minutes, we're just going to scratch the surface. But hopefully there'll be some things here that uh, people haven't heard about or haven't thought about before and give us plenty of uh, food for thought and, and questions as we go. So let's go on to the next slide. So this is it. Where to start? OK, now this is the first point I want to make, and I think it's a very important one for all of us musicians. Try to separate you from your playing as two separate things. Because what we find when we play solo in particular is that we feel that we're being judged as people um, and that our being judged as a person and, and your playing being judged are wrapped up in one and the same thing. Uh, and somehow, you know, if you're a better player, you're somehow a better person or people are going to like you or whatever reason it is. Mm -hmm. But it's the idea that the playing is something that's separate from you. You know, you are the person, you go on stage, you're smiling out and you look and people hear you're playing. And it's the idea that they're not necessarily judging you, um, they're listening to your playing. And from a psychological point of view, when you're on stage, just separate yourself slightly from what you're doing and not feeling that it's a personal thing uh, is really, really important. 
This is easier for instrumentalists than it is for singers. For mm. singers, of course, it's their actual voice, so it's actually them, it's embodied, it's inside them. So it's much harder for singers. But us instrumentalists, we can think of our instrument basically as a kind of tool um, that's kind of on the outside of us, and that somehow, you know, our playing is separate from us as individuals. So moving on. <clears throat> so mindset, okay. So one of the most important things about sort of combating performance anxiety is to have the right mindset. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, one thing I should say also is that performance anxiety is not something you can actually get rid of completely. It is something that is actually at a low level is very useful to us. Um, but it's a bit like something like soundproofing. People say that a room is soundproofed. Of course, there's actually no such thing. You can ins insulate a room against sound <laughs> and the sound, the outside noise will be a lot less. But to eradicate it totally is impossible unless you put yourself in a vacuum. So similarly with performance anxiety, you know, we want to reduce it. It's not as if we're going to solve the problem forever. And indeed, that kind of little excitement of adrenaline can be very positive. So... This is really just a repeat of the first slide phrased in a slightly different way. You are who you are, not what you do. You know, yeah. there was a, a classic thing recently when they were talking about Queen Elizabeth II, who's recently passed. And the question she would always ask people is, oh, hello, what do you do? And I don't know, I'm slightly uncomfortable with this idea that you're somehow equated with what you do for a living is what you're doing. And it's, it's something that's sort of very much part of modern life. You know, if someone says, hi, how are you? you know the next question so often is what do you do you know that as if the kind of working hours are somehow more important than the leisure hours you know um or the sleeping hours or the socializing hours or this kind of thing so again with a mindset with playing an instrument you are who you are not what you do so what you do is something separate from you um and if it doesn't go particularly well it's something that rather than getting upset about you can kind of almost distance yourself from it and slightly oh well Next time it'll be fine. It's okay. Anyway, let's move on for now. Fantastic. Yeah, so, I, I, I thought this was a, I, I thought this was a, like a very German thing to ask. Okay, yeah, hi, <laughs> who are you? Oh, you're Steve. So what are you doing? So yeah, yeah that's it. <laughs> well, this is this is a very you know this is it. Yeah, um, uh, yeah let's let's press on. Yes. Is, uh, okay, now this is a key one here. This is your expectations can transform outcomes. So this is kind of along with the lines of various sort of ideas of positive thinking, but it's the idea of setting up expectations for something that's going to happen. And often if they're positive expectations, it actually can transform those outcomes. Now, this sounds like, you know, um, self-help bullshit, but actually there's, there's a book which came out at the beginning of this year, which is on the next slide, which is called The Expectation Effect. Now, this um, for me was, was I really loved this book when it came out because it basically provided scientific evidence in many, many, many examples of how actually having a positive mindset can transform your life and the results of what happens. Um, and I found this book absolutely fascinating because it kind of confirmed a lot of the things I was thinking, but even took them a lot, lot further. Um, you know, we're only beginning to get to the very edge of understanding our brains and how they function and their higher functioning, which is sort of way, way, way beyond anything we possibly imagined. You know, then there's all the sort of subconscious stuff that goes in your body, recent research into what happens in the gut, all this kind of stuff, all this sort of automatic processing that goes on in our bodies that we don't really have any conscious control over. And what the expectation effect does, it shows how positive thinking or sort of uh, um, projecting positive futures can actually have a positive result. And conversely, uh, negative attitudes can, can lead to negative um, results. Anyway, I'll leave that there. For those who are interested, I, I recommend it thoroughly. There's a sort of um, summary version of it on YouTube where you can hear what the whole book is about, like in 10 minutes or something. Uh, also, if you're in the UK, BBC Radio 4 serialized the book in an abridged version again. But it doesn't take that long to read. And actually, if you read the first few chapters, you get the general gist. But for anyone who suffers from performance anxiety and doesn't think they can do anything about it, this is the book for you. It really is very interesting. Um, and so I'm not on commission for this, but there you go. <laughs> okay. So next one, things to remember. Uh, everyone has performance anxiety. Doesn't matter what level of playing it is. Doesn't matter how experienced someone is. Really interesting thing happened 
uh, after the pandemic, when players went back to playing concerts for the first time in sometimes 18 months to two years, suddenly there was that increased anxiety. It was back. You know, as I'll go into a bit more detail later, the one thing that really helps performance anxiety is to perform an awful lot. Um, and there are ways of doing that that doesn't mean you have to go on a big international tour. So the first thing is that everyone has performance anxiety. It's not just you. <clears throat> if people look calm and relaxed on stage, it doesn't mean that they are calm and relaxed on the inside. This is a huge thing. Um, because basically, so much people will feel uh, relaxed and enjoy themselves if they feel that you are relaxed and enjoying yourself, even if you're not necessarily inside, even if you're terrified. The idea that you look calm and from the exterior, then everyone in the audience will relax. There's a thing which which happens um, yeah, sort of psychologically, which is that there's a sort of um, mirroring between what's happening on stage and what's happening on the audience. Sometimes the, even the breathing is mimicked between the group on stage and the people in the audience. And if someone is nervous and they're breathing in a very shallow way, sometimes that projects itself onto the audience and they start doing the same. So it's really important that even if you're not feeling calm inside, that you try and look calm and appear calm because that will calm things down. So as I already said, the more performing you do, the easier it is to control your performance anxiety. So let's look at the next one. Things to remember. This is uh, the great Ricardo Isneola, whose book on practicing I've talked about before on turn-based different ways of practicing <clears throat> and so on. I'm not going to go into much of that detail now. I'm just going to give you this one quote, which is uh, an ultimate truism, and you can't really argue with it. What happens on the concert stage is a direct consequence of what happens in the practice room. There is no magic and no mystery. Good practice results in good performances. Poor practice will produce poor performances. So I'll just leave that there and recommend uh, another book, which is um, Ricardo Isneola's very small book published by Mel Bay called On Practicing. And just to give a little spoiler about the content, it's not about the quantity. Good practice doesn't mean the quantity of practice. Like there, and but this is a whole other topic. We've talked about the quality of of of, of practice uh, as well, and will probably again because it's just such a vast opportunity to talk, to talk about how we can how we can significantly improve, but with. Uh, but not with just like mindless repetition of things. But it's a fantastic. What was the name of the book again? Um, on practicing. On practicing. Ricardo Isnaola on yeah. practicing. Here you go. Okay, fantastic. Absolutely right. So next, here's the big question: What is performance anxiety? How do we define it? <clears throat> well, here are some. Uh, it's a very useful definition on the top bullet point: the experience of persisting. Uh, distressful apprehension uh, about and or actual impairment of performance skills in a public context. So there you go. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so doubting your ability, fear of loss of control, feeling you're not fully prepared. Incidentally, on feeling you're not fully prepared, no one is ever properly fully prepared. Mm. Uh, if you find yourself in a situation where you're going to go on stage and you're not fully prepared, then what you have to do is make some compromises and make sure you're not putting yourself in unnecessarily stressful situations by attempting things you cannot do. Um, if you're not fully prepared, there is nothing wrong with adapting a piece or even removing a piece from your program if it's not prepared. And uh, we'll come back to that. Fear of memory slips, it's a big fear. We don't necessarily worry about them when we're practicing, but suddenly we're on stage, we do, because the brain is working uh, at a much uh, higher speed because of the adrenaline being pumped around the blood and there's more oxygen in the blood and so on. Heart is beating faster. There's doubt that the audience will enjoy your performance. This is something that uh, I still get as a composer sitting in the audience when my piece is being played for the first time, especially. There's like, you know, I, I kind of, are they enjoying it? Uh, how's it going? Uh, what's it like? Uh, and I remember that stage very clearly, that feeling very clearly on stage. It's something that we do think about a lot when they're playing. We're sort of worrying that we're kind of losing the audience or making them bored. Um, and then, of course, even if things go well, certain people may still be disappointed. Uh, and that's to do with the audience, which is kind of coming next. So that is what performance anxiety is. On the next slide, we have some of the physical symptoms of uh, performance anxiety. And these are very real. Um, increased heart rate, palpitations, shortness of breath, 
hyperventilation, dry mouth, sweaty hands, and so on. You, I mean, a lot of these things on this list uh, you'll probably recognize. Um, our breathing patterns change. We get a lot more tense. Um, we tend to play music faster than we would in the comfort of our practice room, all this kind of stuff. And it can often lead to quite extreme symptoms like um, actually being physically sick or it affecting, you know, it's giving us diarrhea, also a sense of dizziness. So they're very real physical symptoms that come from this, uh, from the adrenaline. Um, there are also a whole lot of psychological symptoms on the next slide. Um, so this sort of subjective feeling of anxiety, you know, how long before a major performance do you start thinking about it? Do you start getting anxious? Is it an hour? Is it a day? Is it a week? Um, now, here's a big one. Interference from a negative inner voice. How do we find, you know, our, ourselves talking to ourselves in our, in our heads um, and these kind of doubting words that sort of are given, we're giving ourselves. We'll come back to that one too. We worry about sort of forgetting words or fingerings or how the music goes, losing the sense of pulse, playing too fast or too slow. Loss of self-esteem. This is a big one. If we're not feeling good about ourselves, then we're feeling much, much more anxious. Poor concentration diverting attention so there's the psychological symptoms we have already people in the chat talking now that they are quite nervous about memory slips when they are already ah. talking about when we when they're watching a live stream like yeah. already thinking about getting nervous of memory slips so this is this is a, this is a huge yeah. huge topic. it's a huge topic memory slips is, is a huge topic and um yeah. we can you know we'll talk a little bit about it tonight but there's, there's two things really um one is is the way that you use music on stage I mean, one thing I often recommend people to do is not to have the full score on them in front of them, but to have the bits that they know that they need. And another thing is developing a way of playing with the music where you're not looking at the music all the time. This is the big danger is that when the music is there. Yeah, it's occupying your whole head. It's, during it's the occupying your whole head. And, you know, I often think of it a bit like, you know, going for a walk. Um, and the idea is that you're going for a walk along a stream and you're not even thinking about the stream, but then you get thirsty, so you put your cup into the stream and drink from it and then carry on walking. You know, it's not as if you're swimming in the stream with your mouth open the whole time. <laughs> you know, this is this is the kind of, uh, if you like, a, a, a sort of um, allegory uh, for this idea of your head being fixed in the music. So there are ways of, of playing as if you're playing incredibly freely, but with the music being there. And in fact, what's interesting is that as um, artists get a bit older, uh, they start playing for music again more. Um, I don't want to name names, but but various people over the age of 50 now use a, an iPad or a score when they're performing. And, you know, it needn't get in the way. It really needn't. Um, so, you know, there's nothing wrong with using the music. The only reason you'd have to play from memory is if say, it was some requirement for something you were doing. But there's no shame in playing for music. And one of the glorious things about playing chamber music is that the music is there. Yeah. So yeah. we'll come back to that. And, and there are certain traditions where it's just like normal to have this the score at your Absolutely. hands. But when you have an oratorio singer, for example, it's yeah. a tradition that they have the scores there, Absolutely. as opposed to, for example, an opera, where, of course, you have all the acting and mm. their score might get in the way, of course. But it's just like, um, like this is a very like, why is there this this kind of distinction that they get to have a score, for example? Yes. So there shouldn't be uh, such a like like a stigma on using. using no, using, ab using absolutely. I mean, the weird thing is, if you're playing, if you're a violinist and you're playing with a piano, the convention is if you're playing a concerto with a piano reduction, you play without the music. But if you're playing a sonata, you play with the music. <laughs> I mean, where's the sense in that? There's also also a tradition that if you're playing a complicated modern work, then it's fine to use the score. You know, so this is um this is an interesting debate, right. and uh, my own personal view would be that why not the user score if it's not going to uh, have any detrimental effect on the performance. Exactly. Um, okay, let's move on. So here we go. <clears throat> what are the reasons why do we get anxious? And actually, I really think it's just down to these three things. Uh, number one is the critics, and you, yourself, the performer, are your own worst critic. Funnily enough, we give ourselves performance anxiety because we want to do ourselves justice, and this is a massive one. Uh, again, this is going back to the, you know, it, is it you or you're playing, um, is that we, we put ourselves under unnecessarily ridiculous pressure. 
we imagine for a start that we can play as well in public as we can at home on our best try through unrealistic yeah. you know we also imagine that we're going to play to a new high level on stage unrealistic we start comparing ourselves to our peers or other players and start feeling that we need to somehow live up to them so often our view of other people's playing inflects and uh, can be our you know again ourselves criticizing ourselves then the audience the fact you're playing in front of people and that audience could be two people or two thousand people the actual size of the audience doesn't really seem to make much difference actually um you know especially online i have no idea how many people are tuning in now but you know we may discover at the end that on on youtube there are 12 people and on tone base there are three more or we may find that there's a thousand people in total got no idea <laughs> um but the final thing that gives us performance anxiety is the performance space itself the large room the new space and we'll talk a bit about that as well why that unsettles us so much and why that's such a big deal okay so that's a lot of preamble that's a lot of defining what performance anxiety it is and uh, why we have it on the next slide we come on to strategies to for reducing performance anxiety Wonderful. and again notice it's reducing um i've got four things here in bold uh because i'm going to talk about those in a bit more detail next and a whole lot of other things as well so practicing performance is a big one and we'll talk about that now some of you may have heard of the inner game this is based on timothy galway's book the inner game of tennis um which is a book about how to focus um to get the best possible performance and we're going to talk about that one in a in the next slide in fact the use of visualization and also the use of intelligent programming i'm going to come back to uh there are other general techniques which some people use and have preference for ones or others mindfulness is always very good um the idea of sort of being in the moment and for those people who practice mindfulness it's, it can be a very useful tool for reducing uh performance anxiety um Alexander Technique, people who are practicing that and practice that beforehand and so on. Progressive relaxation, this is a big one. And you can get some, uh, you know, relaxation um, uh, sort of audios and sort of um, meditations, if you like, which you can listen to on audio. And this is the whole idea of selecting, you know, it's lying down somewhere still and quiet and selecting particular muscle groups and systematically tensing and relaxing them and focusing on different parts of your body and doing these things and taking breathing exercises. And this is a really, really good way of reducing heart rate before you go on stage. A number of people do this too. There's a whole system um, based around Brain Gym, which has various courses, various books and so on. Then techniques like yoga, tai chi can also be very helpful. Um, but the bottom one is a really interesting one, adjusting the focus from the narrow to the wider. The idea that actually thinking more about our peripheral vision rather than trying to focus in on a particular thing can also really help reduce that, that tension. Okay, so the next one is book recommendation number two. And this is Timothy Galway's book, The Inner Game of Tennis. There's also an inner game of music, inner game of golf, and so on, all the same principles. And this is about voices in your head, largely, the idea of voice one and voice two, the positive voices and so on. And it's a really, really good um, sort of system or approach to keeping concentration and focus when you're doing something that requires that. It's, it's basically it's what the book does is it uh, helps you become aware of how you can cut out those interfering voices all that noise, all that sort of interruption that sort of tends to happen. When we're in a position of great stress, like on stage, um, and uh, more oxygen is going to the blood, everything's firing off at a much, much higher rate. So the idea of just focusing on the one thing that you're doing becomes harder and harder and harder because there's so much other stuff zapping around your brain. And what the inner game does, it helps you sort of cut out some of that extraneous noise. Um, very, very good book. Very, very well worth uh, the time so that's two books uh, and th those are my two big book recommendations oh and ricardo is is on practicing which is a very small book so you know if you're going to do anything after this uh live stream i'd recommend those three books and they they uh, all together they will help a lot i would say yeah so let's move on mm -hmm.
Ah, musical memory. This is a tricky one. We were talking about playing from the score and all the rest of it earlier. Um, memory is a, is a big cause of performance anxiety. Will I have a memory slip? What happens if I have a memory slip? Uh, and it's interesting, Martin, that this has already come up in the chat. This, this is a biggie. Yeah. So we generally talk about three kinds of memory. Oral memory, the memory of how the music sounds. Visual memory, how the music looks on the page. But also <laughs> the visual memory of us looking at our hands playing the piece. Mm -hmm. Or in guitarist sense, often the left hand, actually. And then physical memory is, is the memory in your body of you know, getting around. You know, it's, People often call this muscle memory. Um, of course, muscles actually have no capacity to remember anything, but it's it's a term that we, we kind of use and we know what we're talking about roughly. So these three kinds of memory, and if you rely on just two or one of them, you're going to be in trouble with memory slips. Um, if you've got all three, uh, then you're going to be much, much safer on stage. And by using visualization, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, it's a really, really good way of getting a much stronger sense of the oral, the visual, and the physical memory of, uh, of performance. So let's move on to some practical exercises. Here we go. So here's a long list. I'm going to go through a couple of these in a bit more detail in a minute. In particular, um, the sort of top two, visualizing and making the performance space your own. So we'll come back to those. Um, performance conditions, uh, you know, what, where you are, what the environment is like, attitude towards the music. Now, here's a big one. Um, again, it's back to the, you know, uh, to separate you and your playing. It's sometimes a really good idea to separate you from the music, you know. Um, this is an area which can go in different directions. You get certain artists who, you know, uh, the way they play the music is all about them. It's all about, you know, their magic and their artistry and so on. Um, but sometimes there are players who are just thinking about doing justice to the music and how can I make the music do its thing? And moving that center of focus away from the idea of me performing to me trying to communicate this music to the people who are sitting in front of me. So the music becomes the focus. Um, and this next one is part of that, imposing programmatic detail. This is something that Paul Tortelier did, um, others too, is that they actually impose a really detailed narrative on the piece that they're playing. Now, it doesn't have to have anything to do with the piece and no one even needs to know about it. It could even be sort of uh, horrific or erotic. It doesn't really matter. The idea being, that you start thinking about characters and stories in order to bring the music to a more sort of three-dimensional life. And what Tortelier did is that he would have, he would think of different characters who would be speaking at a particular point and a story developing. And by focusing the mind on telling that story, uh, managed to cut out a lot of the other noise and also not to worry about anything technical like shifting and so on. Um, so actually imposing a kind of really detailed narrative can be a really good way to give the mind something to really focus on that takes a lot of the mind. And then just thinking about that while we're playing rather than anything sort of cold and technical. Because you can't really have any control over what's going on technically while you're performing. You've either practiced it in advance and it's all basically there and it's in your body, or you haven't and it's not. So combating interference and loss of concentration. Again, this is going back to the inner game sort of ideas. Best and worst case scenarios. You know, what's the best thing that can happen? What's the worst thing that can happen? I was thinking about performance anxiety this week in the football game between England and France. Oh. <clears throat> you know, uh, this is performance anxiety. We can't even begin to imagine the scale of pressure on Harry Kane's shoulders but he comes up to take a penalty that will either keep England in the World Cup or will pretty much ensure that they are going out. You know, in front of a television audience of millions, yeah. if not a billion worldwide, not to mention all the live people there in the thing. How do you keep your concentration and focus? I mean, what must performance anxiety be like for those people? You know, we're worried about playing in front of a dozen people in a church hall. These people are playing in front of a you know TV audience of, of millions. Um, so, you know, 
in our instance, the best case scenario is that the concert goes quite well. The worst case scenario is that we don't think it goes that well. From an audience point of view, the difference between our best case scenario and our worst case scenario is very small. Yeah. Um, they might think it's between 97% attainment and 92% attainment. What it feels like for us on stage is that our best possible situation, of course, is 100, because we're all perfectionists. 150. Uh, <laughs> um, and then, you know, our worst case scenario is zero. We imagine there's this whole gamut of, of possible scenarios. Whereas, in fact, you know, even if we have a real dog's dinner of a performance, you know, most people aren't really going to notice. And I'll talk about how we can um, uh, not draw attention to when things are going badly in a minute. Um, next is role play. This is a really interesting exercise. It's something actually that uh, Zoran Dukic does with his students in the first year. He gets them to learn a piece in the style of someone else playing it and try to exactly copy the way they play the piece. Oh, wow. To remove their ego completely from their playing in order to just kind of use their ears and just copy and have the role of being that person. Um, and it's a really useful exercise. Actually, you know, try and imitate Segovia or John Williams or Julian Bream or whoever. Um, but also then, of course, that you're, you're sort of removing the onus from you onto this third party. So that, you know, you're like an actor, you're playing a part. Um, and this can be really useful, even if you are not copying a particular player. You might have a kind of way of playing the piece in mind, which you kind of keep separate in your head from your own personality, your own persona. It's like, you're right, you've decided you're going to play this piece in this particular way. And that is, again, separate from you, like an actor. It's separate, you know, yeah. the part is separate and so on. And of course, the most important thing is permission to fail. You know, uh, there are so many people who feel terrible after a performance, look really crestfallen, and really as if the world has ended. Whereas in fact, all that's actually happened it hasn't gone quite as well as they thought it might. Yeah. You know. I think this is um this is uh, especially a problem when when you're dealing with institutionalized um way of um of a uh, how do you say it? what's the what's the word when there's a test just in music school, you know, in music university because you really feel like oh man i'm i i might be able to fail i get a bad grade i might get a mm. bad future i get a bad life mm. while in while honestly it's just like it's just just one concert in the university for example but i but you have to give yourself that permission that, that to fail and uh, and see the consequences that these have these these uh, failures They, you have to put them in, into context. This is difficult for someone who is in in that system, in an institutionalized system. But um, to be honest, like I, I don't. I had a I had a lot of bad bad performances <laughs> during during my concerts because I was suffering a lot from mm. from performance anxiety mm. uh, when I when I was in university. And I think I turned out pretty okay. I guess. Well, I'm here talking to you now, so I'm I, I'm I'm guess that's a win. <laughs> well, this this is we also misplace um, significance on performances. Yeah. Um, we sort of imagine that every performance we do is of great significance, you know, life changing almost. Yeah. Of course, it's not. No. You know, and also, you know, in, in college, it was really interesting. I was going to start this talk by talking about um, what a surprise I had when I was on the other side of the table. You know, all my life I'd, you know, be either doing exams or competitions or whatever, or playing on stage. But then when you're on a jury, you're much more kind of sympathetic to what's going on in front of you than you ever imagined as if you're a, um, you're playing. And also the real truth is that people, even if they're concentrating quite hard, um, are concentrating nowhere near as hard as you are as the player on stage. And all the things, all the details that you pick up about your performance, most people just miss don't even hear them you know yeah. and it's just this uh and you know permission to fail even the word fail is is kind of uh it has so many negative con you know connotations but actually you know um i would consider myself a very resilient person um but that's largely because i've had a lot of failure in my life you know yeah. and <laughs> that's how we get shaped 
yeah. <laughs> a lot of things that haven't gone according to plan. A lot of things, you know, sort of moments where I've really gone for something and it hasn't happened. Of course, you'll never read about this because my CV sounds wonderful and everything seems a dream, you know, <laughs> like Facebook life. It's like this kind of wonderful thing. But I have a friend, uh, Cheryl Francis Hode, who's a composer. And on her website, she has a failure CV of all the oh, plans man. that she had, all the things she'd applied to that didn't come off, didn't work. That's you know? amazing. I love that. I think that's, uh, and, it, and it's actually, you know, you learn far more from that, these kind of knockdowns. It's like, well, you know, hang on a minute. Whereas if everything yeah. is plain sailing the whole time, you don't don't spend much time reflecting or thinking or building up a kind of uh, resilience and, uh, you know, it can affect your determination. I mean, how people deal with failure is much more important than how they deal with success. Absolutely. There's there's also in the, in the, in the startup world, there's also a tr tradition uh, called I, I'm not going to, to to say the name of that because otherwise we get demonetized on YouTube. But uh, let, let's call them the F up nights, um, where just people talk about their their failed startups and how how they just miserably failed and, and crashed during the process. But you can just you can learn so much more from these stories and and those Absolutely. are this and, and you know as you said there is there is a certain life that we that we project and this is this is part of the part of the danger that we compare ourselves to these lives to those perfect instagram and facebook timelines where mm. everybody's just having one one exhilarating concert after the next one but what 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 you don't see is what all the all the suffering that might <laughs> might have led to a certain outcome and because we want to share the, the the good stories but i think there's 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 a wonderful i, I love the idea of a failure cv maybe maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe you could maybe look, look, look her up Cheryl francis heard is there on her website so she's and she's an extremely successful composer and wonderful wonderful musician but you know this is important so let's um let's start with an exercise let's have some practical things so the next slide is a is a visualization exercise number one um now visualization is uh, the process of imagining something that's going to happen in the future basically um so first thing i put here is find inner poise this isn't always that easy actually we tend to rush into stuff before we're really in the right frame of mind or body to even even do it and finding inner poise will often require sitting down in a chair and just letting go and it may take 30 seconds it may take three minutes but just to get into a different place and this next point listen to the room is a really really important one this comes from um John Cage's four minutes, 33 seconds in many ways, actually, because, you know, people think of it as the silent piece. But what it is, is about attention. It's just giving a listening attention to the sound that you can hear in the room. You know, if I'm to stop talking now in here, what do I hear? Just me talking over the silence. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like you can't have silence on a tone-based live stream. What's going on? What's he playing? Never. Never. <laughs> in my first year music history lectures I used to give many years ago, I used to um, do a complete performance of 4 minutes 33 in front of a large group of people. Um, and, you know, it's a long time. Yeah. And it's, you know, we, when we do not stop for that amount of time, ever. And actually this idea of listening to a room, just sitting down and listening to the sounds that you're not normally aware of, the whirring of the, of the computer uh, or distant traffic or, you know, uh, dog barking or, or anything really or rain on the windows so listening to the room and sort of being in the space so it's really important to get in that space first and then the first part of this exercise is to look at the first two lines of your score and try to hear the music in detail in real time this is the key thing trying to hear the music in your head in detail in real time i'm not talking about a piece you've never seen before i'm talking about a piece you may have practiced a lot already, uh, you may be very familiar with. So it's not, it's not a sort of stupendous test. Um, but the key thing here is listening to the music in detail, really hearing not just the melody, but everything that's going on, bass line, inner parts, and so on. And in real time, and what is the tempo? Can you imagine a piece in real time? You'll be surprised how difficult this is. You know, if there's a piece you play and it lasts four minutes, 12 seconds, um, and you sit down and you, with the score, and you listen to it in your head and what you think is real time. It's really hard to match the time to how you play it in real life. But it's an incredibly important skill to be able to do that, to have control over time. One of the key things about reducing performance anxiety is to control time. Time takes control of us 
in anxious situations. That's why we play faster. The heart is beating faster. Time seems to travel much more quickly. If we take 10 seconds to tune, it feels like an eternity. Whereas to the audience, it's very different. Time is, you know, a very different perspective. So this idea of listening in real time, looking at the score, then shut your eyes and listen again. So exactly the same thing is to listen through from the beginning, those first two lines with your eyes shut in as much detail as possible. And then the next stage is to imagine yourself on stage here in the hall, performing those two lines to an appreciative audience. And that's the important thing is that in visualizations, audience is always appreciative because basically and by and large, Audiences are appreciative. They don't go to concerts to suffer. They want to have a good time, you know. <laughs> they, they want to, you know, I'm at a concert because I want to hear someone play. You know, this is, I like music. This is awesome. So oh, I'm going to a concert again. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing. We, we somehow imagine that audiences are antagonistic or against us in some way. Yeah. Even juries at competitions, you know, juries want everyone to do well. They want, you know, they're, they're happy to be there. It's actually, it's a very nice job to have, hearing people play pieces they've prepared, playing them beautifully. It's very nice. So always an appreciative audience. So imagine now there are all sorts of uh, big, um, if you like, uh, music superstars of the past who use visualization a lot. Uh, you can see the names here, Chrysler, Corto, Glenn Gould, Rubenstein, Claudio Rao, and so on. It's it's a thing that lots and lots of people use. And if you've never done it, it's really worth experimenting and trying it. But starting with this two lines of music thing, no more. Um, okay, so that's exercise number one. Uh, and this helped because what this does is that it gives us a kind of calm and positive reinforcement of what the performance situation is going to be like. Imagining yourself on the stage, performing those two lines to an appreciative audience, you're in control, you know how they go. So this again is the expectation effect, this is doing it, rather than worrying about the performance. What we do sometimes when we worry about a performance that's coming up, we don't sit down and try and live it in real time. We have these kind of annoying flashes that flash through our brain of negativity and, and destruction, you know. Um, we, we might be practicing, we play a passage and we mess it up and we imagine messing up that passage in performance. So these these kind of uh, almost like lightning bolts of negativity are stupendously unhelpful. You know. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> what a, what a, there, there, there was this, man, this, we, we, we should write, write a quote about this. You know, when you're like, when you're anxious, you, you, the time is taking control of you instead of the other way around. I yeah. love that. And this this exercise, it, it, it's true. Like you you seem like everything seems to be so out of out of control out of control yeah. and especially at the amount of time everything that you do seems so awful awfully long while mm. in reality it's like even when you are a mistake when you make a mistake and you try to recover from it you mm. know uh, you you feel like it's it's take you gazillions of times until you are back into a state where people might enjoy it while yeah. in in truth it's just just one note that that might have been missed. Yeah, and, and the other thing is, of course, is that well, that one moment leaves a deep trace on our memory. So when we yeah. think back to the performance, we're just brought back to this one tiny moment and it colors our whole view of what's just happened. I mean, this is another, you know, we're all guilty of this. I'm not pretending for a second that I'm immune to these, these feelings, but we just dwell on these things. It's, you know, it's part of human nature. Yeah. So let's go on to um, the physical performance space. Now, this is a really important uh, idea. It's the idea of somehow making the performance space feel like your own, like your happy place. You know, we all have safe places. Here I am, I'm sitting in my house. I've done, you know, during lockdown, I've did, did many, many lectures and things from this seat in this chair. It's very comfortable, set up very nicely. I've got my screens around me. You know, it's warm in here, it's cold outside. Uh, it's a very safe space, so I feel very comfortable. You know, if I was giving this talk uh, in front of 200 people who were freezing cold in a hall I didn't know, my performance anxiety would be enormously higher uh, than it is now. You know, and there's still an element of it now. I'm still, I'm aware that I'm speaking faster than I would do if I was having a normal conversation with you. I'm aware that, you know, people are listening, so I'm consciously processing and rethinking everything I'm doing. Um, you know, so... Here we go, the performance space. 
So this is our visualization exercise number two. Imagine yourself taking control of the space. It's your space, okay? So you're not you're not going into an alien environment to perform. It's your space. This is, you know, you on stage. The stage is a nice place to be, you know, the lights or whatever. Imagine that the audience is really looking forward to hearing you play. You know, think of what it's like when we go to a concert of someone what we really want to hear play. You know, there's that excitement. You bought your ticket, you're going along, you made a commitment, you sit down. You know, as we said earlier, you're not doing that to have a horrible time <laughs> to beat yourself up. You're going because you you want to enjoy it. And you're going to have a, a mindset when you enter that room that you're going to have a good time. You know, obviously, unless you're a critic. But um, it's a different different story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you ever see the, the film Birdman? It, it completely summarizes the sort of uh, yeah. unpleasantness of critics. Um Anyway, moving on. Um, so here's the big thing. Now, this is this is the hardest one to get across at all. Uh, the idea of thinking of excitement and anticipation rather than apprehension and timidity. So excitement and anticipation, a bit like going to bed on Christmas Eve and knowing next morning you're going to have your presents when you're eight years old. Unfortunately, not when you're 58 years old, but wait, what, what can we do? So that excitement and uh, anticipation rather than apprehension. Now, this is a big shift to make, and it's very easy to, for me to sit here and say that and knowing that a lot of people suffer absolutely big time. But this is this is what we're aiming for. This is our sort of end goal. It's the idea of feeling excited and anticipating and wanting to get on stage. There's another thing that happens to a lot of us is that we're terrified to go on stage. It starts going badly. We relax into it. We get off the stage and we immediately want to get back on. We've had, we've had such a great time. And in a minute, we're going to come we're going to come to talk about those the worst times, which are just before you get on stage and for the first few minutes when you are on stage. Okay, here's some practical advice for taking control of the performance space. So visit the room before the event if you can. You know, uh, if it's somewhere local to you and you can get in and have a look around, you'd be amazed how often you can get into spaces just by going up and saying, can I come in? Can I have a look around? Um, because actually, if you have a really good visual memory of the space you're going to be performing in, it helps you prepare an enormous amount. The more familiar the space is to you, the easier it is to make it your own when you get there on the day of the concert. And even if you're just there on the day, make sure you arrive early. You know, Formula One drivers often will walk around the track so that it becomes stupendously familiar to them before they get in their cars and drive around it. So sometimes going and sitting in a seat near the back, sitting near the front, getting a feel of what the space is like, not just on stage, but from other perspectives too. Um, if there's lighting, trying the lighting as well, well in advance. And here's an important thing, make adjustments until things are just right. A lot of people don't, they kind of take it, they just take what they're given. If the lights are too strong, say, can you turn the lights down? If it's not lit well enough for you to see the music, you say, can you turn the lights up? You know, it's not unreasonable to ask these things. If the chair is too high, ask for a lower chair. And if they haven't got one, then um, tell them they've got to go and find one. <laughs> you know? it's, you've got to be comfortable. You've got to be absolutely comfortable. I remember yeah. years ago, Jonathan Leithwood used to take a chair with him wherever he went. Um, I think Paul Gabray still does. You know, takes his chair and his uh, thing and the rest of it. So that, you know, for us guitarists in particular, um, the height of the chair is incredibly important. You know, pianists have adjustable piano stools as a, you know, de rigueur. Violins are standing up, but guitarists, you know, we need a chair of a certain height and often we can't adjust it. So, you know, it's really important to think about things like the chair because that kind of thing can throw us completely. If it's too high, we're suddenly tensing in all sorts of places and we don't feel comfortable. Yeah, and the whole all movements feel feel off suddenly. Yeah. Like I like I, I should have done you you should have talked to me maybe like fifteen years ago or something like when I went to my first international competition in Spain to Petrer and I was there prepared my, my Turina sonata and my, my Barrios waltzes and stuff. And I, I went there and I absolutely slayed the barrios because the chair was too low and my footstool was too high and I was feeling it was a horrible experience, but it uh, taught me a very important thing, which is you need to feel comfortable. You need to take your time to to make yourself comfortable before you start and make that space your own. And I, and, and that's 
that's basically that's what we talk about today and this is such a huge advice because like you are sometimes when we play in a certain a certain hall we are not forced in a certain position we can yeah. make it and we should make adjustments because we are there to perform for others and uh, yeah i i didn't do that i learned my lesson so now i take every second <laughs> i can and yeah make it my own it's true i mean you know last year i was at a competition i won't say where and there were two chairs on stage for people to choose one or the other but they were ridiculously close together and they weren't in a good position on the stage they were too far back Nobody, nobody thought to move them, you know, when they came up on stage. And this is the other thing is that sometimes you you think, you know, because people have clapped you, and if you find that you're on stage and things are not quite right, it doesn't matter how long it takes, you have to get them right. Because what feels like hours for you on stage is nothing to the audience. You know, and the audience will talk to each other. They're, they're fine. They're very chilled. So this next point, try not to feel rushed on stage is huge, absolutely huge. There's this famous, uh, sorry, to, sorry, sorry to interrupt there, there's this famous uh, um, uh, performance of uh, last or last year's or, or year's year's uh, Chopin competition of Aimi Kobayashi, uh, <laughs> where she was just not happy with, uh, with the chair she got. And she did take her time in front of a multi-thousand audience during the live stream and in the Chopin hall. And then she got her right chair and she played beautifully and uh, she really made that space their own because she insisted okay that's that's what what is needed for for her to to bring the best possible performance onto the stage and uh that that i think i'm i'm sure that took a lot of guts to do that but I, it was fascinating to see people made made fun of it but i think it was just man you you gotta like be in that position and ask for that you know that's a that's a that's a that's a big one <laughs> well i think you know after all it's 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 our time if we're a soloist on stage what the only thing that's happening in that room at that time is focused on you and if you're not comfortable and you could be comfortable you've got to change it yeah. you know this is this is really important um you know not to try and sort of somehow make do with what you're given yeah. in these situations yeah. and try not to feel rushed and of course you know the audience is on your side again it's not as if there's this event it's not as if it's a tennis game with you on one side of the net and 200 people on the other you know uh this is not a sport i mean the, the number of times people sort of make a parallel between art and sport it's just not a sport you know they are two entirely different things yeah. um and you know it's uh it's like when we go to the movies we you, you know you, you want to go and watch a film, that's why you're there, and you want it to be good, and you'll be quite forgiving, you know? Yeah. Okay, so. All right, the mental performance. Uh, yeah, so we've had the physical performance space, the stage and so on, now the mental performance space. Now this first one is a biggie, and this could be a whole live stream um, session all on its own. I put here, escaping the tightrope mentality. Now, the tightrope is basically what you might call an interpretation of a piece that has to be exactly the same every time. Something that's reproducible and that is your, if you like, your interpretation in inverted commas, your tightrope. Um, so the exact right tempo, the exact right thing here, right thing there, right thing there. And often people who practice in this way to try and reproduce things exactly produce very unfree sounding performances because for the simple reason they're walking on a tightrope. And when you're walking on a tightrope, you can't really relax because you can fall off it very easily. Whereas if you have a much broader approach, instead of a tightrope, maybe like a bridge where you can just stand firmly with two feet on the ground, you can move around. So here's something. To reduce performance anxiety, you should be able to play your piece at the speed you'd ideally like to play it, then up to 20% faster and up to 20% slower. If you can't play your piece 20% faster than the speed you want to play it, then you're playing it too fast. If you put yourself on the tightrope limit of what you can do, and then the adrenaline pushes you yeah. 10 metronome beats per minute faster, you collapse, it's over, it's finished, you hit the wall. So there's got to be that give, not only faster, but slower. Mm -hmm. So a variety of tempi. 
also a variety of dynamics, articulations, other things, the idea of exploring a piece from as many different perspectives as possible. If you find yourself in a very dry acoustic, you're going to have to play faster. If you're in a cathedral, you're going to have to play slower, and you've got to kind of get used to that idea. Yeah. And we'll talk about this when we talk about practicing performance in a minute. Um, okay, so managing your performance space, um, yeah, escaping the tightrope mentality. And then managing your inner performance space. This is your headspace, basically. This is how you psychologically prepare. Uh, and this is to do with the idea of preparing for the fact that your brain is going to go crazy when you're on stage. And you've got to know how to combat that and never be surprised by it. Um, maintaining flexibility, uh, you know, being able to play slower or faster or doing things in a slightly different way. How you maintain concentration, lots of different techniques for doing that. The storytelling one we've already spoken about, um, the inner game thing we've already spoken about, but concentration is a really tough one. Um, you know, when I was playing in the quartet, you know, sometimes you'd get very sort of relaxed on stage playing in chamber music. It's very different from playing on your own. And then suddenly you'll find that your mind is wandering and, you, and you're thinking about, you know, what's happening after the concert. Uh, you know, is there going to be, uh, you're quite hungry. Is there going to be food? Can you be able to find food later? You know, all this kind of stuff suddenly comes into your mind when, you, when you're actually doing a concert. You know, you've got to, you've got to suddenly pull yourself back to that, that situation. So in those instances, I mean, you know, there isn't enough adrenaline flowing around yeah. to keep you focused. Been there. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah. And then... Again, this common thing we keep coming back to, which is time, stage That's time. Tonight, sorry, I'm just kidding. Exactly. Well, totally. You know, <laughs> then you sort of then you're reflecting on something someone said before, or there's some problem with the transport, or you didn't have enough rehearsal time. All these things are just kind of floating around. Yeah. Um, and then this big thing is stage time is different from real time. You know, I, I'll keep coming back to this because well, the way the, the speed that you feel time is traveling when you're on stage compared with how it feels from the audience point of view is so different. Um, you know, we all know that we can perceive time in, in different ways. If we're doing a pursuit, we're really enjoying time flies. If we're waiting for a bus and we haven't even got our phones with us, then time moves very slowly. Um, stage time moves super, super fast for us. We feel like it's going by so quickly. And there's just, just the idea that on stage, you can just take, always take more time than you think. Yep. This is in the playing too. People rarely take enough time. Anyone who's ever had a, a class with me at any point uh, will know that I'm always complaining they're not taking enough time. Just occasionally people will take enough time, and that's amazing. In fact, recently I was talking to David Watkin, the cellist, who uh, recorded the Bach Cello Suites, this wonderful recording. Uh, it's been going on for 10 years ago now. And I saw him recently, I said, you know, I still use that recording as an example of, you know, how much time you can take in these Bach pieces. And he said, well, the funny thing is that if I recorded it again now, I would take much more time. <laughs> Even more time. So it's, um, yeah, time, it's a big one. And often that kind of rushing and that speeding up is the thing that can um, make the anxiety grow. That's another thing we're going to talk about in a moment um, is, is how fast anxiety can grow and how we can make it go down. Um, I just realized I can't see a clock. Let's see how we're doing. Oh, time is marching on, isn't it? All right, so it's much easier. Let's carry on. Um, yes. So what's next? Here we go. Okay, so this is kind of super obvious. Performing is performing. There is no difference between performing with an audience or an exam or audition or competition. Performing is performing. As soon as you let the situation change the way you're thinking, the way you're performing, then you have external forces basically telling you what to do, which is not necessarily a good thing. So an audience is a singular thing. And it's always good not to try and think about individuals or different members of an audience ever. Yeah. Just think is the audience is a singular thing. We can also, it's not reliable, the feedback that we get on stage from an audience. It's not reliable. There's certainly feedback you get and you sort of get a sense of how the room is feeling. You can do some, oh, they're bored, or, oh, you know, um, the examiner yawned then. They must be really bored with my playing. It's or, hard to read a room when you're on stage. It's really hard. Yeah. 
Exactly. It's so hard to read a room when you're on stage. Um, and then, so this idea that performing is performing, that in a way you kind of think, well, I can't read the room, so therefore I'm going to assume that everyone's having a great time. Yeah. And often they are. And actually by just almost imposing a kind of um, uh, happy state on stage, a kind of comfortable state on stage, will actually have the power to change the room. So rather than let the room affect you, you're the one pushing out into the room. So that's that one. Um, and here's the important thing. You're playing the music, not the score of the music. So you're not trying to sort of exactly replicate something sort of complicated and precise. The score is a kind of, you know, vague map on which you can, you know, extemporize, improvise, move on, and so on. All right, moving on. Um, okay. Yeah. The panther and the monk. The, monk. the panther and the monk, yeah. So this is the idea, is that in your practice room, you are the monk. You've got this kind of rational thinking side to you, and you're kind of, you know you're able to be calculating and calm and doing your work and thinking about, oh, this fingering works best here. So that's it. So you do all this work, all this preparation in a way that you're kind of giving your body this knowledge. And then when you're on stage, you turn into the panther, you turn into the wild animal, where you have no, and you're working entirely on what we might call instinct, intuition, embodied knowledge. It's The stage is not the place to think. The stage is the place to be. Um, and again, think of a panther. Think of something reacting and uh, just um, to the things around it, and, uh, and, and that's it. Um, playing. You know, we talk about playing in English. We talk about playing an instrument. We don't talk about working an instrument. We talk about playing an instrument. Uh, and just a reminder that what we're doing is fun. You know, it's a fun thing. Uh, Okay, going a couple of uh, dots downwards, try to move your audience, don't try to impress them. This is a key thing. People would much rather hear three notes played poetically, beautifully, one after another, than someone sort of messing up an incredibly difficult piece. Um, it's normal to feel nervous, but you should appear calm. This is the key thing. This is what everyone does. Even people you think are the most you know, calm people in the world on stage, Often, deep down, they are nervous. No one is counting your mistakes, and most people don't even notice them. Sure. This is a massively important point. Um, really, really important here. No one is counting your mistakes, and most people don't even notice them. Often, the only way they notice them is if you draw attention to your mistakes by making a face. Yeah. And everyone, I mean, so many people do this, like a and it's almost as if what they're saying is, I've just made a mistake. I'm worried that you don't think that I know that I've made a mistake. So I'm going to make a face to show you that I know that I've made a mistake. So you can relax and know that I know I made a mistake. <laughs> whereas. <laughs> well, well, well. Well, whereas the thing to do is to make it appear that you haven't made a mistake. And then the person will think, oh, maybe they didn't make a mistake. You know, after Schnabel said that, after his worst concerts, he gives his broadest smile and his deepest bow. <laughs> as soon as you show the audience that you're not happy, they pick up on him. And they do not pick up on him otherwise. Um, you know, we're, we're so worried about playing, you know, this kind of perfectionist attitude of getting everything absolutely on the money. Whereas, in fact, you know, sometimes it means it's, it sort of strangles the music. Yeah. So try not... Uh, yeah, we haven't got so far to go. I'll, 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 I'll keep going and do questions. Sorry if we run over just a little bit, but um, this is a huge topic. Oh, so, oh, <laughs> oops, oh, sorry, sorry it. about that. I kind of yeah, quick, <laughs> you got carried away. So the next one's really important: the three types of practice. This again comes from Is mm -hmm. Um Building time, if you like, which is sort of you know basically learning the notes finger by finger, whatever. Interpretive time, thinking about how you want to do it. Now, this bottom one is the one we do not spend enough time uh, doing, which is performing time, practicing performance. Um, and a lot of people don't even do this at all. And I'm going to explain now what practicing performance is. 
and we'll see um, if people who are sort of tuning into this think, now, do I do this? Or maybe is this something I should do? So let's have a look at this. This is kind of where we're going to the, the key moment here. Now, most of us practice in the same room nearly all the time, facing the same way on the same chair. What we naturally do as human beings when we're playing in an instrument in any room at all is that we play to the size of the room. Um, so that's what we're doing. We can hear the sound in the room. We don't try and project outside the room. Um, but then suddenly we find ourselves in a big space, like a concert hall, and we've suddenly discovered that we've actually got to play in quite a different way. We've got to project the sound and fill a space. We can't play like we do at home. Some people do, and if you're in the audience, it feels like there's this kind of invisible box around them. They're just playing inside this box, rather to the back of the room. Um, and the thing is that you play very differently in a large room. Yeah. You no. Know? Um, so what we've got to be able to do is be able to practice that kind of projection. Now you can do it in a small room. And the one of the best ways of doing it is having a window and looking out of a window, looking at a tree or a building opposite and projecting your sound and thinking my audience is sitting there. That's where I've got to project it. But one of the best ways of doing it is just to find a large space anywhere in your life, a local church, a local village hall, pub, restaurant, anything when there's no people there, just a space to go in and play in a bigger space that, that actually simulates a concert hall where you're going to perform. So... <clears throat> you know, um, select a performance time. So you think, I'm going to give a performance at 3 o'clock this afternoon or 7 o'clock. If your final recital for your degree is at 10 a.m., then for six weeks before, or however long you've known the time, you do your performance at that time of day, you know. Mm -hmm. um, next thing, find an audience, real, technological, or imagined. So a real audience, okay, is real people sitting there listening to you. Could be two, could be five, whatever. Technological, video camera or uh, microphone. Uh, or imagined, just imagining there's an audience there. Sometimes that can actually make you feel nervous. Wear performance clothes. This is a crucial one. Yeah. Um, it was really weird. Uh, many years ago, <laughs> I was going to a dinner and I was wearing what I, I would wear for one of my quartet concerts. And as I put the jacket on, I started feeling nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> it was associated with, with the performance. So where, where your performance clothes and most importantly, your performance shoes, you know, it's really surprising. People think, oh, these trousers are really slippy. My guitar. You know, they're not putting their concert trousers on until they get in the room. Mm -hmm. I seeing a, a guitarist once and her dress had this big sort of sleeve and it kept getting stuck in the strings. Oh, so she had to sort of roll the whole thing up like <laughs> so get it out of the way. So wear your performance clothes. So simulate a performance as closely as possible. And in brackets, and the most important thing of all, no cheating. So what we do when we're practicing performance is that if we make a mistake, we correct it or we go back. Yeah. You know, and we cannot do this. And you see that when people mess up in a concert, you realize they haven't practiced what they do when they mess up. And by practicing performance, it literally means you start at the beginning of the whole program and you play through the whole program. You don't go back, you don't change, you stand up, you bow, you simulate it as much as possible without cheating. Do this regularly, every day, leading to a real performance. And actually, this is the most effective way to reduce performance anxiety, making performance a normal thing in your life, even if there's no one there. Okay, now this next point is basically my last main point, and it is probably the most important. Intelligent programming. Okay, so here's the situation. Your heart rate increases and the adrenaline boost peak. Well, I didn't read that very well. Heart rate increase and adrenaline boost peak just before you go on stage. And for the first few minutes, you're playing on stage. You're probably aware of the fact that once you've been on stage for a while, you start feeling more comfortable. So the, and this is a key one, the next one, the brain takes an incredibly large amount of information the first few minutes or even first few seconds you're on stage. There's lots to take in. Even if you know the space quite well, there's people here, there, everywhere, the room has a certain atmosphere. So your brain is fully taken up with doing that. You're, you're most vulnerable to performance anxiety at this time. Mm. So this is the time that we really have to look after ourselves just before we go on stage and the first few minutes we are on stage. So the solution, now, I can't emphasize this first point enough. Start your program with something short, easy, and familiar. 
short is really important because once you've finished it and the audience has clapped and you sit down for your second piece, you're going to feel much more relaxed. Easy, you do not put yourself under any pressure at the beginning. And familiar, something you'd be able to play all your life. We've all got pieces, and we know this, we've all got pieces that if you're at a party, it's two in the morning, and someone says, oh, you're a guitarist, here's a guitar, play something. The piece you know you can play at two in the morning when you're very, very drunk should be the piece you start your concert with. Uh, And if you look at people's programs, a lot of really top players do this. They'll start with something really straightforward and short. Also, it gives them a chance then to talk to the audience a little bit after the short piece and get into it. This will set you up to perform at your best because it reduces anxiety quickly. Now, the next one, select pieces and tempi carefully. People tend to play in concerts most of the pieces that they learn. Some pieces you learn to improve your technique. Um, you really don't want to be showing people what you can't do in a concert. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and this, again, the idea of tempi, 20% lower, 20% higher. Choose your tempo carefully. If you're too near that edge and you're, you push it on stage, you'll get into big trouble. All right. Sure. So the final visualization exercise. This is this is the sort of where visualization eventually leads to. This is the kind of ultimate goal if you're doing it a few years. So again, find inner points, listen to the room. Now look through all the pieces in order that you're going to play um, and try to hear the music in detail in real time. So like the two line thing we did at the beginning, but here's the whole thing with the music. One of the things that often a lot of us are guilty of is putting the music to one side way too soon. So practicing from memory without the score there. But actually looking at the score without the instrument all the way through in real time is a really wonderful thing to do. And once you've done that, you take a break. And then you do the imagine yourself on stage in the hall, performing the whole program in real time to an appreciative audience. You take the time to imagine yourself walking on stage, settling down, preparing to play. You imagine yourself standing up at the end of each piece, taking a bow and enjoying the audience's applause. The stronger the visualization, the more empowering it becomes. Uh, remember the expectation effect. This is incredibly powerful stuff, visualization. And it's no surprise that so many of the sort of top soloists over the last couple of hundred years have used it so much. It's not a new idea. It's not special. It's not mine. It's what people do. So final slide. Takeaways. Takeaways. Here we are. If you, there's nothing else you remember from this, this hour of your life, um, these are the four takeaways, I would say. So everyone has performance anxieties. You can reduce it by using a number of strategies. Embrace a low level of performance anxiety because it actually helps. Um, for example, you know, if you've got a bit of adrenaline in your body, you don't sneeze, you don't cough, so you don't interrupt yourself. Um, and try to separate you from your playing. This is the biggie. We get in the way, we're too worried about our fragile little egos when we play. We imagine that if things go badly, it reflects badly on us. It doesn't. It reflects badly on our playing, which is a small part of us even if we're professional players. True that. Wonderful. Steve, Mm. this was absolutely wonderful. Um, Here we have some, uh, uh, again, the uh, like uh, rundown of of the books that you were were mentioning along the way. Fantastic. And I don't know about you, but like listening to this, to to, to you explaining about performance anxiety, it made me excited to go back on stage. That's just wonderful. a pity that I don't have any concerts at the moment, but I should <laughs> yeah. I should go out and, and, and just like do more concerts again because like it is so something so 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 precious and something so we are so how do you say gifted that we have this opportunity that that we learn something that people really do enjoy when we present them and it makes us like it makes us special but not in in the in the kind of way where you just rub it in your nose you know because we enjoy also doing what we do so even if we do it in solitude but playing in front of other people is just so it gives you so much when 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 you can enjoy it it's just a symbiotic effect as you were saying like you 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 um project positivity and then you you get positivity back when when you're done right <clears throat> So no, absolutely, I mean, uh, and it's interesting that people who play in other styles don't get so anxious about performing. Uh, jazz sure. players, folk players, yeah. you know. Yeah, absolutely. So we are. Uh, let me bring up this uh, 
uh, this thing again. Uh, people have been asking what what uh, picture I used there. It, it's actually created by by the Dali artificial intelligence. I think I just entered the the, the name. Um, an oil painting of a guitar, a piano, and a violin in a space nebula explosion, something like that. And this is what I got, and I find it, find it pretty inspiring, and people like it. So, questions. We have gazillion questions. We already have a little bit over time. We excuse, uh, like, excuse us, but we got, ta got taken away, gotten away uh, with time with this fantastic topic. But Steve, um, we do have some questions which I would like to go into because we have some fantastic ones. Uh, one uh, very interesting from the first couple of minutes of the stream. How do we separate ourselves from our performance without robbing ourselves of the right to take pride in a good performance? Ah, well, <laughs> that's a very good question. But of course, you know, if a performance goes well. Um... Own it. Own it, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, but it's still it's your performance that you take pride in. It's not you're taking pride in yourself. It's not, you know, it's it's oh that performance on that night, that, you know. But that's a good question. It's true. I mean, you know, performances. That's another thing is that we should um, lower our expectations of what a satisfying performance is and what we should be proud of. You know, um, we can. Uh, it's possible to give a very satisfying performance that is not perfect, that is blemished in some way. Yeah, and, and then again, we're human. Like, of course we can have double standards. You know, if a performance is bad, then it's not me. But if a performance is good, yes, I rock that. Of course you can do that. It's your performance. Oh, it's, it's like I've always find with critics. You know, if someone writes about my music and they love my music, they're just, they're fantastic critics. The best critics, yeah. Yeah, and if they don't like my music, then they know nothing and I shouldn't trust them anyway. You know, this is... <laughs> exactly. This is, this is how we protect ourselves from the... Yeah. From reality yeah so uh, but but to 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 be a little bit more like of, like i think the distinction is um is something that if you you don't need to be so academic about this distinction when we say okay uh, we are separating ourselves from from the performance because of course a, a, a positive performance experience is so rewarding and and you should mm -hmm. you should own it a, a, and like take take joy from that because that's mm -hmm. why we continue to do that so uh, there's nothing nothing forbids you to do that <laughs> so but fantastic fantastic question fantastic comment then we had some questions about the books which we were mentioning um i will share the uh, the presentation in the uh, in the forums and there you can read up all the books that we were uh, that we were uh, talking about and next question by matt let me um quickly read through that uh, my perf okay. Uh, the question: My performance anxiety stems from a fear of loss of physical and technical control. What exercises or practices, approaches to recommend? Uh, do you recommend uh, to improve overall control during a performance? Right. Well, the reason that we lose control is because of um, the exaggerated effect of the adrenaline. So, what what can happen is that what well, you know the thing I've been talking about here is how you calm yourself down and, and when to prepare for the peaks of, of the performance anxiety, which is largely a few minutes before you go on when you feel really sick and you think, why am I doing this? I don't want to do this. And those first few minutes on stage. If during those first few minutes on stage, things do not go well, then you get a kind of um, snowball effect with the anxiety. And then a lot of the um, psychological side of it begins to interfere with the physiological side. And that and, and your sort of psychological attitude and thinking about your performance can actually have a, a, a detrimental physical effect. If you think, oh God, I'm nervous, it will perpetuate your nervousness. If you think, oh, I'm losing control, it will make you lose control. Um, and so the, this, the, the secret really is to understand that that anxiety is going to happen and to embrace it in some way and to have various techniques to sort of minimize the impact it's going to have so that when the adrenaline rush calms down you're in a really good space on stage and you're ready to continue um you know one thing that happens is you know you play your first note and if it doesn't sound just right that puts you on a downer and it's and it's that how do you recover from uh that kind of thing well i suppose you know the answer to that one really is that you know you've got to just listen to the sound and think, okay, that's what I'm hearing. I will now adjust rather than being overwhelmed by disappointment, yeah. you know? And I think that's, that's another thing is that sometimes if something doesn't quite go wrong, you let the kind of 
um, disappointment and anxiety, think, oh, I knew it wasn't going to go well, now we're off. I mean, one friend of mine sort of said that, you know, they really like it when they make a mistake. Uh, you know, if it's been perfect up to a particular point, they'll make a mistake and go, oh, thank goodness for that. I'm human. I'm not a machine. That's great. <laughs> Fantastic. But, Wonderful. But it's, yeah, but these physical things, they are sort of, um, you know, they're real and they're big and they're, and they're problematic. I mean, I think the way to, you know, to answer the question in a serious way is is to increase the amount of performance practice, as in practicing performance that you do, um, you know, and in, in quite safe environments to begin with and kind of work your way up. What tends to happen is a quantum leap between our normal practicing and then the super high pressure of a particular situation. And there's no link between the two. Mm. It's a nice little sort of step-by-step Pradesad Panasam type um, approach so that it's not a big leap. But sometimes those big leaps that can throw us into a really horrible situation. Absolutely. Um, next question, very important one, um, which uh, we, we we should address. When performing, I feel calm, but my hand shakes. I now take a beta blocker. What are your thoughts on using prescribed medicine? Mm. Like well, disclaimer: we are not doctors, so no, we cannot, we, we, cannot, we cannot we cannot we cannot give you any medical advice. No, so I mean I know people who I know people who use beta blockers. I know people who have a brandy before they go on stage. Um, you know, each each to their own. I mean, a kind of reliance uh, on an artificial system like, uh, like a drug is not necessarily a good thing. But, you know, on the other hand, hormones and things that go on inside the body are are similar. You know, they're, they're doing those things. And, and the way that medicine works is that it sort of uh, either induces a chemical reaction or, or, or suppresses one. Um, and I think, you know, for some people it works. Some orchestral players have been taking them for years. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. If I had a student who was under pressure and was taking them regularly, I would probably work out a way to wean them off it. Um, placebos can be really, really useful. Yep. Um, you know, if you're using beta blockers, um, if it's possible to kind of get placebo ones and not know when it's a placebo when it's not, um, there's a lot of really interesting stuff about that and the expectation effect and the power of the placebo and the nocebo, um, which is uh, not taking anything but still having a, a positive effect. It's a lot of really interesting kind of thing in the yep. science, and I think that's where I would direct this questioner. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, wonderful. I just want, also wanted to hear because, like, growing up in a in a in a in this high intensity environment of like. Uh, like in a music uh, university performance competitions, especially orchestra players whose future relies so much on a singular performance when they play in front of an like for for a position in an orchestra. Um, I heard I heard this also a lot, but I like I I didn't have any any like I I'm on the same page as page as you where I think if you need to rely on on something like that, you can get in a dangerous space. But then again. Mm -hmm. We're not doctors. Like, if there's something that you need to do in order to do what you want to do, um, and your doctor says so, then you know you know what I mean. But uh, we direct this uh, this uh, conversation and these questions to the, to the people who who study that. <laughs> so uh, we have two more questions. Uh, one fantastic question um, by a gymnastic coach. Um, it was not in the Q&A function, but it was in the chat, but I found it so fascinating that I wanted to direct it to you. The question, as a gymnastics coach, I would teach students how to counter the most common problems that happened when performing, such as losing balance on the beam and how to recover doing that. Um, and I wonder if this work would work for music as well. So actually like training for these moments where where you have a memory slip or where you make a mistake or like 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 what what would you recommend for that mm. no that's a really really good point and it really does come down back to this idea of practicing performance because the you know the problem with the memory slip is it throws us when it's something unusual unexpected and new you know if we're practicing performance and cheating and if we have a memory slip we're also just stop and then start again and think about it. But that idea of having to keep going, you know, having to keep doing it. Uh, and then what we can do, you know, one thing I didn't mention when I talked about practicing performance is that when you're practicing performance, you've got to kind of keep an awareness of what was good, what was bad and so on. And then after immediately you finish to try and reflect on what's just happened, try and write down what you can remember. Yeah. Uh, this is a key thing about practicing performance. It's like, 
you know, because the memory that we have of any performance that we've given is always incredibly um, biased towards one or two particular events, which are often connected to messing up, actually, you know, rather than any of the positive things. And yeah. um, one, one thing that, one exercise that's really useful to do is that when you practice the performance, is to make a list of all the positive things that happen and all the negative things that happen and make sure that you have an equal number of each. And then burn the number the the side with a with a negative <laughs> <laughs> in a ritual. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic, wonderful. The very last question that we have for today, and at that point, I already want to say thanks for everybody sticking around, and uh, and thanks for Steve for taking your time and answering all these questions now after the live stream. The last question that we have now for a like uh, is talking about visual uh, visualizing. Uh, for for a one hour long recital, how would you spend visualize, visualizing w regarding your comment on real time and, and, and stage time? What, what's your recommendation for that? Well, it's a thing. I mean, what we got to the last visualization thing was doing the entire program. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's as good as practice time. It can be really, really helpful, beneficial. But what you do is you build up to that and you build up the stamina to that. And it's a kind of, so there's two kinds of stamina when you're playing. There's a kind of physical stamina uh, of the fingers. You know, if you're going to play this piece in your recital, make sure you can play it after all these other pieces. <laughs> you know, yeah. if you can just play it on its own, that's no good. You've got to be able to play it in context. So what you do first is you learn to be able to play each piece on its own and visualize each piece on its own. First two lines, then more and so on. And then, you know, you might run uh, 20 minutes or half an hour of the program. Again, run that um, physically playing it in a space and also visualizing it until you get to the point where you're rehearsing the whole program and practicing that performance uh, in real life, physically in the room and also in your head visualizing it. Um, but the visualization thing is, if you you know if you're new to it, it takes quite a while to kind of get into, and don't be put off by it. And, and but um, the main thing is to start with small chunks and to gradually build it up over time. Wonderful, fantastic, exactly. Uh, it's like we so so underappreciate the time that is spent like mentally uh, mm. like going into the pieces. We think. Uh, and we've had we've had not only with you, but we we had we had a lot of talks about mental practice as well, mm -hmm. and it's as equal as as important as, uh, as as playing through the piece, and I think every minute spent on a on on, on mental practice with the piece is is, is much better spent uh, than just mindless repetition, playing mm -hmm. playing playing until you make a mistake <clears throat> and then repeating again and hope that the the mistake is not going to happen again. What I always tell my students when they are uh, when when they make a mistake and then start again and make another mistake i tell them okay you know what you just did imagine you want to park your car and you you drove your car like you you bumped into the other car you just drove like uh like one meter away and then you bumped into the car again so what have you won a parking spot no you, you have you, you crashed your car um so it's uh, like going into it reflect what you've been, you've been doing is also part of, of mental practice and i think it's so so important so underappreciated uh, among uh, among our like practicing community and when you are visualizing particularly i mean spending time looking at the score if you're like on a train or a bus or whatever it still fires um the neurons in your brain that fire when you're playing the piece you know it's uh it it's all very helpful and contributory um definitely so it's uh yeah strongly recommend so the last question that i received is just for me adina asked um if i'm going to post this in a guitar and the piano tone is form yes i will and i will also post it in the violin forum because today we have been streaming to all the verticals to all the piano to guitar and to um uh piano guitar and violin yes these are the threes that we're doing at the moment and uh it has been so much fun steve thank you so much for sharing your wisdom among all of our tone base members uh, on tone base and on youtube it's been an honor it's been fun it's been pleasure it's been exciting and i've learned a lot and i hope our members as well and i hope you enjoyed your time here with me as well always what it's always a great pleasure and it's uh, always a lot of fun and great to be able to talk to violinists, pianists, as well as guitarists.
Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody, wherever you are. Have a good night, have a good day, and uh, enjoy the rest of the week. And I will see you guys in the Tonebase community and uh, have a good one. And bye-bye, everybody.